Hey guys, welcome back. It's time for another podcast. This is the first podcast of the semester on forces and fields. So what I want to do is to describe for you the relationship between the gravitational force, which we we're familiar with from last semester, and the Coulomb force, the electrostatic force, which we also dealt with a little bit last semester. But uh, we're going to be dealing with it a lot more here in the near future. So uh, the way the gravitational force works is you've got two masses. Let's call them mass 1 and mass 2. And they're at two different locations, r1 and r2. And the vector that goes from mass 1 to mass 2 is r12. Now, given mass 1, mass 2, and r12, we can use the universal uh, law of gravitation to calculate F12. And uh, it turns out that F12 is always attractive in the case of gravity, and that's because of that minus sign out in front. The masses are always positive. Our hat 12 always points from mass 1 to mass 2, and so putting a minus sign makes the force attractive. Coulomb's law is similar. You have a charge Q1, a charge Q2. They have position vectors that work out exactly the same way. But the force, in this case, is repulsive. There's no minus sign, so if Q1 and Q2 are both positive, you end up with a repulsive force, because R12 hat points from charge 1 to charge 2. But if the, ch if the charges have opposite sign, then the product of the two charges is negative, and the force turns out to be attractive. So that works out very nicely, and we're familiar with that from last semester, but I just wanted to remind you. Now, one trick we like to do is to factor out one of the masses in the force law for gravity, and then look at this stuff in parentheses there as the gravitational field strength produced by mass 1 at the location of mass 2. And then we compute the force as mass 2 times the gravitational field strength at the location of mass 2. So let's look at that a little more closely. So the idea is mass 1 produces a field, g, at the location of mass 2, and mass 2 experiences a force, f12, due to the fact that it's immersed in the field produced by mass 1. That's the idea. Now you can do the same trick with Coulomb's law. You can factor out a charge. You can group everything else into a clump and call it the electric field. And then you can compute the force as the charge, 2, multiplied by the electric field produced by charge 1, in which it is immersed. That's the idea. Now, the reason we do this is not just to make life complicated and abstract, but the fields turn out to actually be real things. That uh, the only way to really get the right answer under all circumstances is to introduce this idea of a field. Um, and we'll talk about why that is and how it is that, for example, if you move charge 1 around, uh, the field doesn't immediately change at the location of charge 2, but actually takes time to propagate those changes out to charge 2. And if we didn't have the field concept, we couldn't take into account those kinds of effects. But again, the idea is charge 1 produces a field at the location of charge 2, and charge 2 experiences a force due to the fact that it's immersed in that field. Now, very soon we're going to uh, encounter a lot of other crazy concepts like uh, electric potential, gravitational potential, and so on. And all this stuff is going to get mixed up. The field, the force, the potential energy, and the potential are all going to get jumbled together in your brains unless you have some active way of keeping it straight. And in, a, in order to enable you to keep it straight, I've cooked up this uh, concept map, which I like people to learn and memorize so that they can sort out what's what. So let, let's talk about it. The idea is uh, we've got a force, we've got a field, we've got a potential energy, and we've got a potential. And there are gravitational and electrostatic versions of all these things. So if I know the force acting on a particle, I can deduce the field strength, or I should say the, the field in which it's immersed by dividing the force it experiences by its mass. So if I know it's only being acted on by a gravitational force, the gravitational field at that location is the force the thing experiences divided by its mass. So G is F divided by M, you could say. 
On the other hand, if I know the field at the location of a particle and I'm trying to calculate the force that it experiences, I can just multiply the field by the mass to get the force. So I can run it both ways. And the other thing is if I move a particle from point A to point B and I want to know the difference in potential energy between those two points, I can use the force to figure out how much work I would have to do to get from point A to point B and calculate the change in potential energy that way. And by a mathematical, uh, I guess it's a theorem of calculus or something, you know that the inverse operation to integration is differentiation. So if I want to know the x component of the force, I take the derivative of the uh, potential energy with respect to x. If I want to know the y component, I take the derivative with respect to y, and so on. So you can see that these two relationships are inverses of one another. I want to define something called the gravitational potential as the potential energy per unit mass. Now that seems like a kind of a goofy thing, but we're going to find out that it's actually extremely handy because there are times when I've got charges moving all over the place or masses moving all over the place, and what I want to know is how much work do I have to do per kilogram or how much work do I have to do per coulomb of charge as charges move from point A to point B. I don't care that much about how much energy it takes to move a particular amount of charge. I just want to know how much is it per cure. So um, anyway, that's the idea. So we, we discovered there's a handy thing called the potential energy per unit mass. Call it gravitational potential. Now if I know the... and why do I have all these arrows here? The arrows are there to help you see how you can get from one thing to another. If you know the potential energy, you can get the force. If you know the force, you can get the field. If you know the uh, potential energy, you can get the potential, and so on. What if I know the field and I want to know the potential? Well, you can see by these arrows that I can multiply by mass, integrate, and then divide by mass. But if I multiply, integrate, and divide, I might as well just integrate, because multiplying by mass and dividing by mass ends up being doing, doing nothing. So, in fact, that's right. I can, instead of going around the top row, I can simply integrate directly. Uh, so the change in gravitational potential is just the integral of the field dotted into displacement between two points. And similarly, the uh, field is the derivative of the gravitational potential. So you can see that you can jump around between these concepts using these arrows and these mathematical relationships. And it's a way to keep your head screwed on about what's what. If you have a question and you need to know something, like how much work does it take to go from here to there, and you know the field, you can see how to get to the work calculation, or if, and so on. So most problems are set up where we know some things and we don't know others, and we have to figure out a way to get around. And, and these arrows can help you do that. Now, the interesting thing is the electrostatic situation is basically the same, except uh, instead of multiplying by mass or dividing by mass, we multiply by charge or divide by charge. So notice in the left-hand picture, to go from the bottom row to the top row, you multiply by mass. To go from the top row to the bottom row, you divide by mass. In this case, with electrostatic, if we know the force and we want to know the field, we divide by the charge. If we want to go the other way, we multiply by the charge. If we know the force and we want to know the change in potential energy, we integrate. If we know the potential energy and we want to know the force, we take the derivative. If we know the potential energy and we want to know the potential, we divide by the charge. And if we know the potential, but we want to know the potential energy, we multiply by the charge. And finally, to go from field to potential, we can skip the multiply and divide by charge and just integrate directly. And to go from the potential back to the field, we can simply take the derivative. So that's the idea. Um, understand these charts. I would say it's definitely worth your time to put them, commit them to memory, be able to regenerate them as you need, because you'll probably need to a lot, because there's a lot of situations in this course when you're going to need to know how to move around among these guys. So that's the idea. Uh, we'll see you guys next time.